It is August 13th, and we are one day over our due date, so everybody is still on Baby Watch. Hey Booktube, it's Kim at Middle of the Book March, and this is my bookish week for Saturday, August 13th. Yes, still no baby. <laughs> still no baby. Uh, my daughter had her 40-week appointment Friday, and they told her everything looks great. Baby is at a good size, not overly small, not overly big, but she still hasn't gone into labor yet, so... She's going back for one more appointment at the end of next week and uh, may be scheduled for being induced in a week, depending on if she goes into labor. So, so okay. Uh, um, I got, I had a, a lot of bookish stuff to talk about from last week, so I'm going to get rolling here. Um, I finished two books, and the first one is a book that I buddy read with the wonderful and bright and positive and sweet Shelley Swearingen. I had the best conversation with Shelley over this book, which we sped read in two days. And um, this woman is extremely smart, very bright. She was a librarian and an educator. So uh, even though neither one of us loved this book, <laughs> Um, I loved our conversation. We were able to talk about so many other pieces of literature that this book reminded us of and different ways that this book provided some sort of connection or symbolism to other books. So we read This Tender Land by William Kent Kruger. And I, we both buddy read it super fast in two days. It's not that short of a book. This is the story of Odie, who is a young boy. He is 13. And he and his older brother, Albert. Now, they are white boys in an Indian training school, as it was called back then, in the 30s. Yeah, summer of 1932. Um, they have been sent there, and we find out that they are orphans. Both of their parents are, are dead. Their father was just killed, um, was shot to death, and their mother died previous to that a few years earlier. So it, it kind of opens up with, why are they there? Why are they in this school for indigenous kids? This is one of those uh, quote unquote boarding schools that indigenous children were stolen from and taken to. And it's the, the history of those schools is harrowing and traumatic and frightening. And this book kind of builds, builds itself out on the blurb the first sentence says, In the summer of 1932, on the banks of Minnesota's Gilead River, the Lincoln Indian Training School is a pitiless place where Native American children, forcibly separated from their parents, are sent to be educated. It is also the home to Odie O'Banion, a lively orphan boy whose exploits constantly earn him the superintendent's wrath. Odie and his brother Albert are the only white faces among the hundreds of Native American children at the school. Now, this is interesting because you would think from that first short paragraph on the blurb that this is, this is a story about how children survived this residential school and why these are the only two white children at the school. That, this book is not that. And that's one of the things that was a little cringy for me in reading it because I'm not interested in even a novel written from the point of view of two white children and how their trauma or their circumstances are any uh, more precarious or more horrible than the indigenous children, the brown children who were there. So that cringed me out a little bit. And this is very much a young white boy's coming of age story. Uh, it reminded me very much of Huckleberry Finn. And at the end of the book, the author writes a note that he did use that as inspiration. Um, it also reminds me of a Wizard of Oz kind of a tale because eventually Odie and Albert, along with their friend Mose and Emmy, uh, run away from the residential school area and they're, they're rowing up the river trying to find something. Each of the four friends is trying to find something different. And we learn about 
each of them as individuals and what the four of them do together to survive. So, yeah, this is very much a commercial fiction novel, which is fine. There's, you know, readers read all kinds of books, but it wasn't as deep or as complex as far as its character development. It wasn't as descriptive in its writing as I was hoping for, but it was good. Uh, it definitely was a fast read and it was very easy to read quickly. But I wasn't interested in the coming of age story. There are plenty of instances in the book that each, they're, they're rowing down the river and they meet different people at different points, which is kind of a coming of age, stereotypical, tropey kind of a thing. And so we read about their adventures when they, they meet each of the different types of people, very much like Wizard of Oz. And so Shelley and I kept going back and forth about how the connections between the Wizard of Oz and this book. Um, there were certain portions that, you know, you needed to kind of suspend your disbelief. You needed to kind of like, well, uh, no, I don't know about that. And then the end of the book, the climax and the resolution came extremely quickly. And so much of the book was one coincidence after another, after another, after another, um, of things that were really far-fetched. So uh, it was good. It was okay. Um, I enjoyed the conversation with Shelley more than the book. And yeah, uh, William Kent Kruger is also the author of Ordinary Grace, which I read and did enjoy. It's it's also yet another young boy coming of age story. But he is the he is the author of a crime series, uh, the Cork O'Connor series, and so I I which I've never read, and I assume that those novels are probably better than his standalones. Even though this book and Ordinary Grace, I know for a fact, are beloved th from readers all over the place. Readers that I know personally and online. And um, it has very high Goodreads reviews, very high reviews in general. So it was not a success for me or Shelley. So, but I do have a book that was. Oh, good gracious. Um... This is the second in a trilogy. This is the second in the White City trilogy. And this is The Water Rituals by Eva Garcia Sáenz. And this is translated from the Spanish by Nick Castor. Oh my gosh, was this good. And let me show you. The Silence of the White City is, is book number one. I read this last year. The Water Rituals is book number two, which is what I finished last week. And the third book is The Lord of the Lords of Time, which I will get to by the end of this year because I'm really eager to read that book. Now, this is in honor of Women in Translation Month. So this is the I'm not I can't give you too many details, but this is the continuing story of um, Unai Lopez de Ayala. And his nickname is Kraken. He received the nickname of Kraken in his teen years. He is a Spanish investigator and criminal profiler. And the, the story continues from the first book, The Silence of the White City. So this trilogy does need to be read in order because there's a lot of background you wouldn't understand and a lot of stuff that is fairly important in this book that you would need the background of the first book to get but it is so good. It is so fast. Again, another book I speed read. There's so much in here of Spanish architecture, the country architecture, the countryside. Um, there is so much depth and complexity in the mystery and the crime. This uh, talks about a crime of um, ritualistic murders and a serial killer that they're trying to track down. There's a lot of family history and background. Oh, it, it's so good. It is so good. And I did not get, I did not guess the ending, which is for me, that's what I'm going for when I read a mystery or a thriller. I don't want to know. I don't want to guess it. I want to think that I, I know the answer, but I want to be surprised. And that's exactly what this book did. And I was, it was so satisfying to read. I loved it. I completely and highly recommend the White City trilogy. If you are a crime novel fan, if you are a fan of, of international fiction and translated fiction, um, 
this author is fantastic. Eva Car Garcia Sayans, The Water Rituals. So, so, so good. So those are the two books I finished. Unfortunately, I had some DNFs. And these might send some of you into some emotional fits, but I'm going to tell, tell you about them anyway. This one is When I Hit You by Mina Kandasami. And I was really looking forward to this book, but it didn't work for me. This is the story of um, a young married couple. There's a young woman who falls in love with a college professor, and she starts off on the hunt for her one true love. And she fell in love with him very quickly. They got married very quickly. And even though there were pretty obvious signs from the the story in the book, from the reader's perspective, um, she got married anyway. And it was within the first month that he was a very obviously abusive, narcissistic husband. And so... As you can imagine, the the plot ensues from there. But this didn't work for me because I felt it was it was written in kind of a flat tone, and there wasn't enough of a background as to why she was so intent on finding that one true love, and why she kind of dove into this relationship so quickly, and some of the relationships that she entered into before that. Now this is highly autobiographical, so it's um, autobiographical fiction. It, it is a novel. But this one just um, didn't work. So I, I kind of gave up. I think I got through 70, 75 pages. Um, Sylvia Plath's Unabridged Journals. This is a, DN, a DNF Y. It did not finish yet. Um, I am still kind of picking through this. But I, I kind of, it was a little, I was on overload reading this because her journal entries are like, Every single entry, is, uh, however long or short it is, is like reading um, Plath's poetry prose. And it's, it's deep and complex and uh, very descriptive. Um, it was, it's too much to read any large chunks at one time. So I will continue to pick this up and read portions of it a little bit at a time and see how long that takes me. This is the one that I feel the worst about. <laughs> Because this is going to be, unless something drastic changes, a true DNF. Um, I, I gave up on the Books of Jacob by Olga Tokarczuk, translated from the Polish by Jennifer Croft. This book makes me feel stupid. And it is so long and so much heft. And physical as well as mental heft to this book. There's so much content that is arcane and so esoteric. You You really need to have a background in ancient Jewish history to appreciate a lot of this novel. It's too much. And I, uh, it was, it became a major slog to try to get through this. And I think I finished about a quarter of it and I'm, I'm, I give up. I, I surrender. So <laughs> I'm going to hold on to it because I tend to be a completist when it comes to authors books, but I just, I can't do it. What is coming up next? I am reading three books I am currently reading. This one is Three Summers by Margarita Liberaki, translated by Karen Van Dyke. This is a book translated from the Greek. And again, in honor of Women in Translation Month, I just started this one. And I'm, I'm not sure yet. I think I'm on page 16. I'm not sure yet, but I'm gonna, gonna keep going, maybe get a little further and see what I decide. This one is the second book in the sophomore novel for this author. This is Hana Khan Carries On by Uzma Jalaluddin, and she is a Muslim author. This is kind of a reimagining of the movie You've Got Mail with Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan. And it's a really charming, lovely story um, centered around a very tight-knit Muslim neighborhood and this family's uh, restaurant, Halal Restaurant. And then I'm listening to a novel. Um, it is An Abbreviated Life by Ariel Levy. Now, there's a few different Ariel Levies. This Ariel Levy, L-E-V-E, -E, um, is uh, a New York-based or New York-originating journalist, author. Um, she is now based in Bali in Indonesia. This is her um, memoir. Now, I, need, I have some notes on this one. I'm listening to this on audio, and Martha Plimpton narrates it, and she is simply fantastic to hear her voice reading this memoir. Ariel Levy is the daughter of the poet and novelist 
uh, Sandra Hockman. Now, I did not know of her previous to starting this novel, this audiobook. And Sandra Hockman um, was a, a best selling poet and novelist in the 70s. She was, and, and past the 70s, she was um, in the 60s actually. She had a book, and I'm not sure which one, who, who, which was a Pulitzer nominated book in the 60s. She was a contemporary and a friend of Andy Warhol, Saul Bellow, Philip Roth, Norman Mailer. Uh, Norman Mailer is, is allegedly Ariel Levy's godfather. But Ariel Levy is discussing her relationship with her mother, Sandra. And it is tumultuous, abusive, neglectful, narcissistic. Um, Levy's tone in the novel is talking about how how she survived her own childhood. And because her mother is fairly famous in New York circles in the poetry world, um, there was a lot of kind of controversy over this book coming out and how her mother was going to feel and what Levy did with the, the family secrets that she revealed and um, her self-analysis. So at times this book gets a little navel gazily, but it's the what she's doing in showing the reader what happened to her in childhood, how she lived with a mother who was completely narcissistic, uh, emotionally needy, uh, what I believe is bipolar, uh, the amount of uncertainty and danger that this girl grew up in is is pretty incredible. And so it's it's been an interesting memoir to listen to. And I'm almost, I think I've got maybe a, th maybe a quarter of it left to go. Um, and I'll have some more coherent thoughts at that point. But so far, so good. It's really interesting. I have a buddy read coming up next week. Now, I found out about this book from Kelly, Kelly's channel, Books I'm Not Reading. And she and I both want to reread it. So we're going to buddy read it next week together. And this is now in November by Josephine Johnson. I've talked about this book uh, several times. It is an incredible novel, one of my favorites. This is a book that I could recommend to so many people. Um, I it's pretty high on my list of novels I've ever read. And this won the Pulitzer in 1934, and this was her uh, debut novel. It's incredibly written, highly descriptive, um, deep themes, deep and depressing themes of a 1930s family. Um, it, that is going through poverty in the Dust Bowl, um, but it is it is so poignantly written and beautiful. Um, so Kelly and I are going to team up next week and reread this together. Now I wanted I'm at the video I'm at the end of the video, but I did want to quickly show you two gifts that I received from another booktuber, and these came from Dia from the channel Novel Idea, and I will link her channel below. She is such a sweet, thoughtful person, and I started to get more into her videos and her channel, and I really enjoy listening to her talk about her books that she likes and the types of books that she likes. And she contacted me, uh, my birthday was last month, and she said, can I send you something? And I said, yeah, sure. And I got, she said she had two books to send me, but I got one a while ago. And it is this one, The Road Past Altamont by Gabrielle Roy. And this is also a translated novel, translated from the French by Joyce Marshall. And this I think I might add to my stack for Shorty September, video coming soon. But this is a novel, um, it's talking about a, a sensitive French Canadian girl, Christine. And it's kind of her coming of age story from her childhood to maturity. And it, this is set up in four connected stories, talking about her, her mother, her grandmother, if I'm understanding correctly. So this is something that I look forward to and I am hoping to put it in my pile for next month. This one I just got Friday. So you're seeing this video on Saturday. I got this yesterday in the mail. And she sent me this beautiful copy of Wuthering Heights. Look at this, this is so pretty. It has the ribbon bookmark. The pages are this reddish burgundy color. And this is the end paper. And in the very beginning of the book, um, this is such a great 
illustration of the moors, the English moors, the setting for Wuthering Heights. In the very beginning, there are illustrations and very specific ones. There's illustrations and explanations of all the characters. And there is a Bronte timeline, which is so cool. And it's all drawn out and it's a few pages. And then there's this, the Bronte country um, map. It is so interesting, the Bronte family tree. Now this is all in the very beginning of the novel. And uh, it's just a beautiful book. It's a, uh, and this is, you know, as I showed you in my Wuthering Heights read along, I have, I don't know, six, seven copies of this book, but I don't care. And one of the other fun things on here is on the front of the book, stamped at the bottom in gold, is the signature for Ellis Bell. And that is the, the um, pen name that, uh, Bronte, Emily Bronte wrote under, and each of the Bronte sisters had a male's name that they wrote under, and Emily's was Ellis. There's also a movie coming out in October called Emily, about Emily Bronte, which I can't wait to see. Now, the other thing that Dia could not have known is she sent me a card, and this is, this is what it looked like when I got it. It was inside the package with the book. And this is, I'm not going to show you what she wrote, but I'm going to show you the outside of the card. I'm hoping you can see how pretty that is, that dragonfly. And that's the back. But this is, this is the illustration on this card. And I'm not going to get into the details, but she could not have known how much dragonflies mean to me. And maybe in another video, I'll explain why. But for a very emotional reason. And this is such a beautiful illustration that I will probably... Always keep that card. I'll probably just keep it right inside that book. So that is it for me for this video. This is a little bit of a long one, but I, I finished two books, but I still had a lot of books to talk about. And let me know in the comments below what you think, if any of the, any of the books you've already read, or if you are interested in reading them. Um, don't make me feel bad if you have any comments about my DNFs. It happens. People, it happens. And that's about it. I hope you've had a good week. I hope you have another good week coming up and I'll see you in the next video. Bye everybody.